Making It Plain, a podcast dedicated to discussing real issues that impact Black communities, Black families, and Black women. Your host, Dr. Key, is dedicated to discussing Black issues in a way everyone can relate. Welcome to Making It Plain podcast. I am your host, Dr. Key. In episode one of Making It Plain, we are discussing Black women and mental health. I have with me Dr. Sarah Williams, celebrity psychotherapist and host of the show, Dr. Sarah After Dark. Welcome, Dr. Sarah. Hello, Dr. Key. I'm so excited. Thank you for having me today. It is my pleasure. You know, I really wanted to get into this discussion of Black women and mental health and some of the stereotypes out there. I read an article from Bazaar Magazine that talked about um, 39 celebrities, and since you're you're in that celebrity area, 39 celebrities have come out and they've talked about mental health. Amongst them are Beyonce, who um, talked about symptoms of anxiety, uh, Michelle Williams, that, who talked about depression, and Nicki Minaj even talked about suicide. Kerry Washington talked about depression. Halle Berry talked about suicide. And you know Taraji P. Henson has been all over really promoting uh, mental health amongst Black youth. Um, and so this idea of, of Black women and, and mental health, when I look at these lists of celebrities, I see them as like these strong women, very powerful. Um, and another recent article talked about this idea of the strong Black woman stereotype harming our mental health. What are your views on that? I seriously believe that that has impacted our um, ability to seek and ask for help because we typically are the backbone of the family. If we look at Black women historically, for instance, Harriet Tubman, she was epitomized as the ultimate strong Black woman that sacrificed her own needs, her needs for nurturing, love, and attention so that she could not only rescue herself, rescue others. And if we take that example and we apply that in our lives today, majority of us, including you, Dr. Key, we're career women, but we also are expected to take care of the family the same as if we were stay-home moms. I think that the strong Black woman is a stereotype. I think the more that we increase awareness about the fact that we are vulnerable beings, without the fear of moving the timetable backwards. I think the fear is that we've worked so hard for equality that there's a fine line between equality and also saying, hey, my needs need to be met. I'm afraid, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, case in point, Angela Simmons uh, spoke out openly about her experience of postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. I'm a mother of twins that both had special needs at birth. I was a doctoral student and a Navy wife. At the time that I delivered my twins, I recall being in the hospital and just crying consistently. I was happy and joyous, but at the same time, I had an overarching feeling of sadness that lasted almost two years. It was only until my pediatrician brought it to my attention that I may be experiencing postpartum depression. I then decided, okay, I'm going to work on this, but I never spoke openly about it until 2018. Mm -hmm. That means that I went from 2005 to 2018 and never spoke openly about the fact that I had been experiencing postpartum. Angela Simmons' revelation made it much easier for me. Mm -hmm. And I saw that through my vulnerability that it did not attack me as a person or a professional, but it actually made me look more real. Mm -hmm. And so the stereotype is, is a myth. It is, it is a myth. And I'm so glad that we're having this dialogue today, by the way. Great, great. So listen, I was reading this study because, you know, I always want to look at statistics, like what are, what are the facts about this? So this interesting study um, found that Black women are self-silencing and um, have the, are, are having depression-related symptoms. But all of that was related to this stereotype of being a strong Black woman. In fact, the women interviewed in the study discussed the idea of being a strong Black woman 
and self-identify themselves as being a, a, a strong black women because of you know slavery and during slavery black women having to be strong to endure the challenges that they face and they felt that they had to be strong to endure the challenges that they face today so they self-identified as strong black women and the study found it was related to self-silencing and depression are black women harming themselves by silencing themselves in order to be perceived as strong? Yes, I think that we are doing more harm than good. I think the more we're transparent and in our transparency and our willingness to expose our vulnerability, that is where our strength lies. It is not with displaying an an outer notion that we can take and accept and endure and be resilient to anything. We are setting a bad example for our children. Our daughters are looking up to us. And yes, they need to have a role model. They need to have a career mom. They need to have a mom that they can go to for leadership. But at the same time, they need to know that I have a mother that's being real with her emotions. That on one end, Dr. Key, if we are giving the impression that we can take anything because as humans, we cannot, then somewhere there's a disconnect. Our children are going to see us displaying other maladaptive type of behaviors, eating, poor nutrition, uh, drinking, uh, smoking. Um, And again, that's where the mental health comes in because we may be able to display the strong Black woman stereotype to the world, but behind closed doors, our spouses and our children probably know different. They know us and they see us suffer and we suffer in silence. So it's a resounding yes, we are doing more harm than good. Yes. And you spoke earlier about the idea of of self silencing and how you didn't even tell anybody and you didn't even recognize your feelings. And I think that is more common. Yes, Dr. Key. It w- so both of us are career women, um, and you mentioned that, and we've been doing a lot um, for our families and our career, just wearing many hats. There are a number of women that are going into leadership roles. And on my journey, I know that I have experienced that the work environment actually fosters this idea of the strong Black woman, meaning we cannot go and complain about poor treatment. In fact, we are supposed to suffer in, in silence because if we do go and complain about poor treatment, then we become the angry Black woman. And so I want to get your insight on, now how do we begin to protect ourselves from this idea that we have to be this strong Black woman in order to not be perceived as the angry Black woman? Uh, that is uh, that is a very perplexing and narrow and difficult journey that we we traverse. And I agree with you because, for instance, oftentimes we're called to be advocates and self advocates. But when we self advocate, we are uh, viewed as uh, difficult, angry, et cetera, and we and we face consequences for that. I have had situations in my life where I self advocated. And I may have ended up being ostracized um, or, or sy- systemic bullying occurred because I spoke up for myself. Um, in institutions of higher learning, we face harassment, whether it be racial discrimination, sexual harassment, because historically Black women have been looked at as sexual beings also. And so we have to kind of break through that stereotype also, and it's very frustrating, extremely. And you can't come off as being an angry Black woman, but if we stuff it, I have clients that come into my office for therapy, and they are executive women that have basically accepted maltreatment to the point that now the lid has been stuffed on so long that they proof finally explode, and they are angry and they are exhibiting behaviors that speak into that stereotype of being an angry Black woman. But if we allow ourselves 
to be assertive along the way, to go to those supervisors, supervisors and those leaders within our own executive circles. If we speak up and we say, I need a mental health day. I feel sad today. I feel depressed today. I feel anxious. I'm not comfortable with the supervisory arrangement in that I am, I am your supervisor, but I know I'm training you at one point to be my boss. Black women, that is a real reality for us. That is a real reality. And we have to contend with that. But I think if we speak openly and communicate our needs effectively along the way, we can kind of break through that barrier and get to an understanding that at the core, we have needs just like everybody else. And it's very difficult to protect ourselves from those situations. We have to put those boundaries up and we have to be comfortable with putting those boundaries up. Um, And I think many of us are not comfortable because we think that we may lose our job or we may be labeled as a complainer or we may be labeled as angry or all of these things. But in order to really protect ourselves from being in this role of being this strong Black woman and expected to take all of this, we have to set the boundaries and speak up. Yes, I I actually um, can speak personally because of something that happened to me. I made an assumption that, um, and this is across any cultural boundary, gender, race, etc. That as a black woman, when you say to someone, "This is unacceptable." For instance, I was in a situation. I was a junior faculty member. I was on the track to becoming regular faculty. I was earning my doctorate and some very inappropriate um, images came to me via email. So rather than going to human resources, I spoke to the individual directly. That was my supervisor at the time. And it was at a university actually here locally. And I, I spoke to this person. I said, you know, please remove that email. And we would hate for someone else to see that because I saw it indirectly. It wasn't intended to come to me but it did. And there were images of young black women without any clothes on. And this happened to me when I was a very young faculty member. I was a young Navy wife here. I went and I spoke to the person and I didn't tell anybody else. I just spoke to this person directly and said, hey, you might want to remove that, etc." And from that point on, I noticed that there was a shift and how this person began to treat me. And it was a very derogatory treatment. And then it kind of spread like wildfire. And the next thing I know, I became the subject of of emotional harassment, isolation, abandonment, and systemic bullying at this university. And actually continues until this day, I can be in certain circles and these individuals will look at me negatively. So it was almost like the person took that situation and twisted something so that the impression would be that I was the bad person. And that goes along with how we experienced Harvey Weinstein and the victims that are associated with the Me Too movement and victims associated with R. Kelly. It's the same thing that when we self-advocate and we speak up for ourselves, then we become a target. I had, I became a target in the community for almost 20 years. Just because I said one thing about that was inappropriate. And so I'm speaking up about that because that gives a message that as Black women, we're supposed to accept treatment and accept inappropriate treatment and keep going and just endure. But what does that do to us? What does that do to our self-esteem? What does that do to us mentally and emotionally? What does it do to us uh, physiologically? Because I went through a lot of changes. I had to do a lot of work in therapy to overcome that. Mm -hmm. And so by speaking about it, it's empowering for me because I'm no longer holding it secret and holding that that situation is no longer going to hold me emotionally hostage is what I'm trying to say. And one thing that I heard you say is that you are a psychotherapist and you went to see a therapist to work through some issues. And people often think that they don't need a therapist. They don't need assistance to work through some of those challenges when they really do. What would you say to women who, um, like you said, they've suffered, they've been bullied, the, the, the lid has been on them so long that now they're just angry. And some of them are suffering from 
um, depression, what would you say to them um, about how or things that they can do to actually heal? I think first and foremost, being honest with yourself, being honest with yourself and acknowledging the fact that I have a concern, not an issue, not a problem. I have a concern. I have an emotional concern. When your child comes to you and they say, mom, my arm hurts or mom, my feelings hurt or I need this, we are right away to be very attentive. Then we need to take that same nurturing and turn it towards ourselves. And that when you do these self-assessments, check your emotional barometer on a daily basis. Check how you feel with your interactions with certain individuals. There may be people that you actually like, but they are not good for you emotionally. And and making sure that you don't allow those emotions to manifest to the point that by the time you see a therapist, you've unraveled, you lost your job, your marriage is falling apart, you're falling apart. That's not the time. The time is to get it early. And there's and and please, by all means, your emotional wellness is just as important as your physical wellness. The two have to coexist. Mm -hmm. You can't have one without the other. And a therapist is the same, should be a part of your team, just like your GYN, your mm -hmm. your eye doctor and everything else. It's necessary. Even if you feel like you're doing okay, every now and then go for an emotional checkup. Just get mm -hmm. a checkup. Just say, hey, I think everything's okay, but let's talk and just see if there's something I'm hiding or something I need help with. Thank you for that. So I went through some things as well and some of the systemic bullying and, and some of those things. Um, throughout my career. And one thing that happened to me is I started to exhibit these symptoms of anxiety. And I started to read up about anxiety and, and I did a number of things to actually change because um, I didn't want to remain a person who has anxiety. So I did a lot of things to change that. And we'll talk about that. But anxiety among Black women is becoming more prevalent. The Anxiety and Depression Organization of America says that Blacks are 20% more likely to suffer from mental health issues. They further state that in Black women, anxiety is more chronic and its symptoms are more intense than white women. Some would argue that the stereotypes of this strong Black woman and angry Black woman and this video vixen contributes to the mental health issues of Black women. This is very yeah. interesting topic, right? What are yes, your views on, on, on anxiety becoming more prevalent and more chronic and more intense amongst Black women? I think that for some reason, I think of the analogy of, if you think of a home and how we build a home. Yes, the roof of the home takes a lot of hits. It can get holes in it. It can get, it has to be repaired every now and then but it is repairable. And the roof of your home can maybe be analogous with your kids, your spouse, um, family members, etc. But the foundation of your home is where Black women are. We are the foundation. If the foundation has difficulty or has a crack of some kind, that is a much bigger issue. That is a much bigger issue. So what happens is the anxiety is developing at a higher prevalence because we are exhausted from holding the weight of everyone else. Mm. We have to hold the weight. We are going about our day and about our careers and say the school calls and oh, I have to go to the school because my child needs X, Y, and Z. And then you try to go into a meeting and you're contending with all types of sexism and racism, and I'm, and I'm just going to say it, attacks from other Black women mm -hmm. that are concerned about your presence. And then you try to deal with that, then husband calls and says, I can't take any more, my boss is this, or I'm dealing with that, and he's, he's coming to you for support. You are the foundation for everything, and after a while, it's just too much. So it's, it's, an, an, it's a heightened because there's a greater effort to try to fight that 
and stay in that mode of the strong black woman rather than speaking up quickly and putting those boundaries in place, taking that time out. I personally take those retreats. I will, I will, I will take time and I will, I will reset my battery. I will, I will recharge. I will close that practice. I will go on a hiatus for two weeks. I will do exactly what I need to do to try to keep things together and keep it in check. And I didn't learn that Dr. Key until later. If I had known, uh, even as a, oh my gosh, doing my journey as a PhD student, <clears throat> if I had known then what I know now, I would have definitely done things a lot differently. And I, I try to teach that same lesson to the women in my practice. Uh, my practice at Covenant Way Clinical Counseling, we focus on working with Black women. We are trying to reach into that hurt, that anxiety, that that trauma, that that um, those issues that impact us and work towards it. The anxiety, you're correct, is it is killing us. There's no other simple, nice way to put it. It is killing us. It is manifesting into heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, stroke, relationship breakdowns, all of it. It is killing us. Well, what are, what are some of the symptoms of, uh, that Black women exhibit? Because um, there may be some Black women who listen to our podcast and they don't even know that they have these symptoms of anxiety. Um, and I know that my symptoms is very strong and there are some symptoms that people don't even know about. Yes. I would say that for from what I observe clinically mm-hmm. is I I observe interactions with people. and. I observe a defensiveness when it's not necessary. When someone gets really defensive, that can be anxiety, meaning anger. Mm-hmm. Anxiety can manifest as anger. Mm-hmm. Anxiety can manifest as sensitivity, being overly sensitive. Anxiety can manifest if you see people that apologize all the time. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And, and they don't need to. Anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, anxiety shows up with how we live our lives when at time we should be personal time, um, when we should be relaxed, but we got to be cleaning or we have to be eating or we have to be, I don't know, anxiety can show up as busyness. Mm -hmm. Anxiety can show up in our relationships with um, paranoia and concern that the, the spouse is going to do X, Y, Z. Yes. Um, for me, I had a difficult time in trusting relationships. Um, I had a difficult childhood with um, siblings that were half siblings, and it created a dissonance for me to not be able to trust people that are supposed to love me. Mm-hmm. So my anxiety showed up that my husband probably for the first five years had to do more than was necessary to get through my head that he really did not only loved me, but he actually likes me. Mm-hmm. And that's really a sad truth, but it was, it was, it was my reality. That's how anxiety can show up. Mm-hmm. And once I did a lot of work and we go back to that same premise. Yes, I did a lot of reading. I went to church. I prayed. I, I talked to my friends, but I went to a therapist mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the therapist helped me to connect the dots, to connect how We had these relationships that may have been boundary violations in some way Mm -hmm. with where we are now in terms of how we experience anxiety. If we are on a highway and somebody cuts in front of you, maybe they weren't paying attention. Road rage. That's anxiety. A lot of the things we see now that we are doing in our behaviors has anxiety as a baseline. Yeah. I know overreacting um, to different situations, it could be a a very mild situation, but you overreact because you're really anxious about it. Um, Thinking that you have to do things now, trying to do so many different things and feeling really overwhelmed um, is also one of the symptoms of anxiety. Um, But one of the things I think people don't even realize is also the stomach issues that you have um, as a result of anxiety. Some people can't eat. Some people can't digest their foods. 
some people can't even feel the sense of when to go to the bathroom to the point where they have accidents on themselves. Um, and so mm-hmm. it can get really, really intense if you don't correct the anxiety. And I must say that um, therapy helps you to understand where the anxiety is coming from, like wearing all those different hats and, and having a, a person tell you, you know what, you need to um, get some assistance so that you're not trying to do all these things because it's impossible to do all these things at the same time. Right. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. I would just want to piggyback on that, that absolutely. And I have people that come into practice and I hear them and they're doing way too much. And then you are right. They have these symptoms along with like the autoimmune diseases that result from a lot of that prolonged type of stress and anxiety. So how do women experience these symptoms and stuff that we discussed today begin to address the symptoms and overcome anxiety? Well, we address it first and foremost by being honest and true to ourselves, recognizing that we do have needs. Those needs do not make us weak. Don't listen to the myth that you have to be strong Oh, you have to be strong for your children. You have to be strong. No, you've got to be honest with yourself first. Your strength lies in your vulnerability, your softness. That's why we were made women so that we could have that. That's why we can give birth. That's why we can nurture our children. And in order to effectively do that, is we first and foremost are honest with ourselves and how to communicate how to meet those needs. What do you need to say to your spouse or your loved one or your coworker or your church member that will help them understand that you need those needs met? Exactly. And just because we can do it all doesn't mean that we should do it all. And that's a different way of looking at things. Yes, we can we can do all these different things, but down the road, it impacts our mental health. So we shouldn't do it all. So, so how do we as black women get back to focusing on ourselves without feeling guilty for being selfish? Because there's this whole idea that you should not be selfish. That is, um, that is definitely a challenge that I have seen over and over and over again, clinically. Um, There is no other species that is viewed as selfish if the needs have to be met. It is basic instinctual survival to have your needs met. Maslow's hierarchy of needs was developed on basic human needs that are deprived. And through that deprivation, that's where the anxiety and depression develop from. So... We have to we have to fight that. Oh, you're being selfish. No, it's called self-preservation so that I can be here for you and not die or be disabled to the point that I can't take care of you. That's the response. Yes. And it's okay to be selfish sometimes. Like you said, when you're feeling like you're overwhelmed or you notice it's time for some self-care, you shut everything down. And that should be okay. That should be seen as okay. I know for me, I have teenagers and my teenagers were so used to me getting up early in the morning. I don't even know why I did this, but I was a single parent. I would get up early in the morning. I would make like these gourmet breakfasts, Mm -hmm. gourmet pancakes and all this good stuff because I had took a cooking class. Then I would get them ready for school. Then I would take them to school. Then I would go to work and then I would pick them up from school and I would take them to dance and I would take them to karate. I mean, I used to do Mm -hmm. all of these things, make the dinner, help them with homework, do it all while going to school to work on my PhD. And -hmm. I realized when I was feeling this, this anxiety and having some of these really intense feelings and emotions that I, something had to change. I didn't like the way I felt and that I needed to make some serious changes. And one of those changes for them, unfortunately, was this cooking. Me cooking these gourmet meals was not happening anymore because I told them that I taught you how to cook so you can cook. So between the two of you, if we divided this up, we can all cook 
and have these gourmet meals. I don't have to be the one doing it all. Um, and I had to get help with other things. Like I had to get a person to help me clean because I couldn't go to school, clean, cook, pick the kids up and do all of the things for them and take care of myself. Um, because I, what I realized is that taking care of me was the last thing on my list when it should have been the first thing on my list so that the kids would be okay. So sometimes we have to be selfish in order to get to a place where we are comfortable, we are thriving, we are healthy. And that's that's the only way that our family is really going to thrive. Because if we get sick and really have all these different illnesses that can be caused by anxiety, that whole house can't stand anymore. That is so correct. And I actually, as a, a doctoral, my doctoral dissertation was on understanding the experiences of women, graduate student stress, and lack of marital social support. And I did a mixed method study and I looked at those factors, the quantitative and the qualitative factors that impact, I called it stress, but stress in a lot of ways is anxiety. Mm-hmm. It's just manifested in stressful ways or stressors. And you're right, taking on too much. There would have been nothing wrong with your children eating school lunch in the morning. There would have been nothing wrong with your with your children having a pre-made breakfast, but somewhere, <clears throat> and I'm and I'm saying you, but me also, because I've 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 been made that mistake as well. Mm-hmm. Somewhere we were taught the lesson that we had to do that in order to um to be acceptable. That that there was something wrong if our kids had a cold cereal and ate at school and whatever that we had to do all these things. But in the meantime, while you're breaking down, your emotions are breaking down and your body is breaking down, the children may be thriving, but only to a point because they're seeing their mother suffer. Mm-hmm. And I had to learn that lesson. I had to get become critically ill from the stress, from the systemic bullying at the university and from trying to do everything. I had to have a chronic illness that my mother had to come from Florida to come take care of me for me to wake up and realize, wait, I've got to change. I've got to take care of me. And I'll give you an example. Kate plus eight, because I'm a mom of multiple. So I used to watch Kate plus eight because it made me feel better because she had eight kids to six twins and whatever multiples. I had two and it made me feel better. But I watched her. And she made a statement one day. She said, I do not rush into my kids' nursery and start my day with them until I've gone downstairs, made myself a healthy breakfast, read my paper, and had a cup of coffee. And then I start with my kids. They can be in there as long as they're safe. But she literally takes care of herself first. When we're on the airplane, we put the mask on ourselves first. And that example needs to hold true in everything. Well, thank you, Dr. Sarah, for joining us today and sharing your expertise. I believe this was a great discussion. Oh, it was. And thank you so much for having me. It was, it's always a delight, Dr. Key. So thank you all for listening to Making It Plain with your host, Dr. Key. If you're experiencing symptoms of depression and anxiety, please seek counseling. And if you can, also visit the website of Dr. Sarah at www.covenantwayclinicalcounseling.com. Please subscribe to Making It Plain to stay up to date on the latest issues impacting Black families, Black communities, and Black women. Visit us at www.thedrkey.com and follow us on Instagram at Making It Plain with Dr. Key. Thank you for listening to Making It Plain with your host, Dr. Key. This podcast has been brought to you by our sponsor, Sparkman Key Consulting, LLC. Check us out at www.thedrkey.com.